Well, our study today is entitled Blinded by the Obvious. And we'll just be looking and concentrating on a little paragraph in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 16 through 18. One day a farmer told his wife that he was going to go out to plow in the field the next day. He got up early the next morning so he could service the tractor. He needed more oil, so he went out to the shop to get it. On the way to the shop, he noticed the chickens were not fed. So he proceeded to the granary where he found some sacks of feed. The sacks reminded him that the potatoes were sprouting. When he started for the potato cellar, he passed by the wood pile and remembered that his wife wanted some wood in the house. As he picked up a few sticks, an ailing chicken passed by. He dropped the wood and picked up the chicken. And as he pondered how to treat the chicken, it reminded him that he hadn't taken his own pills yet that day. So he dropped the chicken and headed back into the house. You know, when evening arrived, the frustrated farmer never did get to the tractor. Uh, let alone to his field. Do you ever have days like that? As the day begins, you have great plans. You know what it is you want to achieve. You know what is most important, and you know how your priorities should be arranged. But as the day begins to unfold, the things that are seen derail your train and you never get accomplished what really is the most important to you. Now granted, every day contains things that are routine and mundane. Our families and our friends need our attention and they need things from us that do take time and there are many things that do happen unexpectedly. However, there are some steps that we can take to prevent our lives from being preempted by the most urgent things that appear in our attention span. In 2 Corinthians, Paul addresses this same kind of problem from a spiritual perspective. And I think he would call it being blinded by the obvious. Like that well-meaning farmer, our lives can get so distracted by what we see that what is most important, which is the unseen, goes neglected and even forgotten in our spiritual lives. So, let me show you what I mean. Open your Bible there to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll read uh, verses 16 through 18. And in these verses, I want us to look at three contrasts, and that's what we'll cover today. Three contrasts. The first one is in verse 16. He says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So there's the first contrast. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed. That's encouraging, isn't it? 
maybe discouraging, depending on where you look. Then verse 17 is another contrast. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Do you see a contrast in that passage? He talks about a light affliction and mentions an eternal weight of glory. See, there's a, there's a contrast. And then verse 18, there's another, there's another contrast. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here's a third contrast. Things that are seen are temporary. The things that are unseen are eternal. Paul can scarcely find words big enough to express the contrast between what believers have to endure now and what they will forever enjoy. Our biggest challenge as citizens on earth is to see beyond what is obvious to our view and keep our view on what is not obvious. As I talk with people every day, many are so burdened down with what is seen, with what is visible. And they have a difficult time grasping what is unseen. They are blinded by the obvious. Now I'm talking about when I go to the hospital, for instance. People I visit are oftentimes connected to these pipes and hoses and there are screens and monitors all around them and they're strapped into their bed, it seems, with all these connections. And they're in discomfort and pain and distress. They're suffering. That's what is seen and it looms large. Another thing is current events. I mean, look at the news. It, it's just so loud in our attention, in our face. And it's, and it's frightening and discouraging and overwhelming. What is seen? And then, of course, all of our problems in life and, and we all have problems. Problems. Every day has a list of challenges and frightful things we're facing. All these things. Well, what are we to do? What are we to do? How are we to survive this as Christians? Well, today, Paul is going to help us put it in perspective. And look at what he says in the very first line of verse 16. Verse 16. Do you see those words? We do not lose heart. Say more, Paul. Because many of us are losing heart these days. Well, he starts out, let's go back now. He starts out with what causes many to lose heart. And that is the, the failing of our physical bodies. He says in verse 16, we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed. You see those words, the outward man perishing? You know, 
what can be seen is often most discouraging. Especially what we see in the mirror. This, this morning, just this morning, I was looking in the mirror and I discovered a new blemish that I had never noticed before. Oh, it was disheartening. The last time I went to a, a, a dermatologist to show my blemishes, he said, I, sh I said, well, I pointed this one, this one, this one, you know, on my arm, this, wherever. He says, you know, those are signs of your maturity. <laughs> Wasn't that a good way to put it? Those are the signs of your maturity. He didn't say I was getting old. He says I'm getting more mature. I don't know. That was a good way to say it. But our bodies, our bodies are gradually falling apart. You know that newspaper print, have you noticed? It seems to be getting smaller and smaller. And, and have you noticed people are not talking as loudly as they used to? And why are they walking so fast and driving so fast? As I said, I visit the hospital regularly. Very seldom is our congregation without someone in the hospital. And my heart goes out to all of our suffering saints who are recovering from all those hip and knee surgeries. It seems our older members should be protected from all that pain. But as they get older, it seems like they're the ones who go through the most pain. And it, and it, it breaks my heart. Paul says, our outward man is perishing. And that's what can be seen. Those, those canes, those walkers, those IV drips, those headaches, that stiffness, that weakness. You know, it's so easy to be blinded by the obvious and get, and get frustrated with life. But Paul does not lose heart <clears throat> because he has... He's focused on something else. He's turned away from what is seen and focuses on what is unseen. And he says, he says, though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. You know, it's possible to be old and young at the same time. Maybe it's old on the outside, but it's young and vigorous on the inside. And Paul says, even renewed day by day, refreshed, renewed. So outwardly, maybe we're changing New blemishes appear. But inwardly, we can also be changing. Changing for the better. How about that? God is working in our lives in ways we cannot see. The unseen hand of God is there to guide us and prepare us for heaven. We will not lose heart if if we bear in mind the unseen realities and that we avoid being blinded by the obvious. You know, if we will allow, I think there may be a relationship between the frailties of the body and a deeper spiritual life. Hardly a life grows deep without pain, somewhere. 
Over and over, Scripture refers to trials as a way of of doing a work inside of us, a renewing work. Just for instance, just hold your finger, and I'm going to go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter for just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read verse 6, 6 through 8. And this sounds almost like what Paul is saying. He says, 1 Peter 1, 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing You rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That sounds almost like copy and paste out of Paul's words. What is obvious is the pain, the trial, the affliction. But what we do not see is the result the eternal benefits to our soul. So let's not be blinded by what is obvious, but rather let us discern what is there that we cannot see. I'm reminded of Malachi 3, verse 3, which says, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Malachi 3.3. I'm looking at the word sit. He will sit as a refiner. You ever thought about the word sit? It brings to mind a goldsmith who sits on the floor by his crucible. One time a goldsmith was asked, how do you know how long to sit and wait? How do you know when that gold is purified? You know what his answer was? It was quite direct. When I see my face in it. When I see my face in it. I know it's pure. I, do, you, do you think our Savior is waiting to see his face in us? And he's willing to sit as long as it takes. Though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Let's go now to the second contrast. Verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See those words, light affliction? Someone might say, whoever calls affliction light must have been a person who knew very little about what affliction really is. If he had suffered as I have done, he would have not written light affliction. Maybe he was in robust health and knew nothing of sickness and pain. 
Another might say, if he had been as poor as I am and had to work as hard as I do to take care of my family, he would not have written light affliction. He must have lived very much at ease and had all the luxuries and comforts many people do not have. Or yet another says, if he had stood by a fresh grave and had to mourn the loss of a dear loved one as I have done, and if he had known what it's like to feel desolate and forsaken, he would not have written about light affliction. Well, did Paul really have that privilege of a life that he would call affliction light? Hold your finger here again, and I'm going to turn about two pages to the right to chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to start at verse 24. Paul will say and describe about what his life was like with regard to affliction. Here he goes. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Is that a light affliction? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Now that's pretty light affliction, isn't it? In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Well, that's pretty light, I would say, wouldn't you? No? In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Boy. Well then, okay. Are those what you'd call light affliction? Well, then you, someone says, well, he must have been so strong and hardened, he didn't even notice his affliction, like a savage warrior who could endure terrible torture without even groaning, and who concealed his inward feelings under this expressionless, hardened countenance. No, that's not true either. Because if you read the writings of Paul, you can see a man of very deep emotion, a man of tender heart, a man who wrote 1 Corinthians 13, a man who was a gentleman, a man of, of tender emotion. He wrote of light affliction, even though he was heavily afflicted. Did you know that 25% of Paul's ministry was in prison? 25%. Well then, why does he call his afflictions light when in reality they were really quite horrendous. It's because he was not blinded by the obvious. Look at verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's how he could call it light. Because it was temporary. 
fleeting, momentary, in view of eternity. In every situation, there are two factors. There is what happened, and there is how we take what happens. How we take what happens goes back to the kind of belief we have about life as a whole. Back in the 1700s, there was a famous scholar and commentator named Matthew Henry. <clears throat> Matthew Henry's commentary is really quite a classic, and you can still buy it. It's a valuable uh, volume. One day, Matthew Henry was attacked by a robber. They robbed him, this, a group of robbers, they robbed him of his purse. Well, he wrote it, he wrote about it in his diary, and he said, let me be thankful. First, I was never robbed before. I'm thankful I've never been robbed before. Second, though they took my purse, they did not take my life. I'm thankful. Third, although they took my all, it was not much. And then fourth, let me be thankful that it was I who was robbed and not I who did the robbing. You see, what is our view? What is our perspective? Paul must have had a similar kind of view because he referred to all his afflictions as light. And the reason was that his view was not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. Well, what does that mean? And how does it work? How did it work? He esteemed them so lightly as if they were not even worth looking at. To him, the present was so soon to be over that he did not even give it a glance. We do not look at things are seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. Here he is, persecuted, hunted, imprisoned, despised, forsaken, and he said, it will not last long. The present is such a little thing. It's only a little pinprick in time and eternity. It will soon be over. And the next thing I know, I will see my master's face. That's how he could call it light. We can all remember a night in a bad motel. Perhaps for you, it was when you were on a long road trip and you stopped for the night. Was the bed comfortable? No. Was the traffic loud? Yes. Did the television work properly? No. Was there an odor? Yes. But you didn't bother to complain because you knew morning was coming soon and you'd be on your way. And now when you look back at that night in a bad motel, well, it's hardly a memory now. It's so far back you hardly think about it at all. Such is our life here. 
We're surrounded by trials. We experience troubles. We have present sorrows and pains. We can rivet our gaze on them and be blinded by the obvious. Or we can treat them with a fair measure of indifference. Can we? Is it really a small matter whether I am in wealth or poverty, in sickness or in health, whether I have great comforts or none? The present is so soon to be over. It's hardly worth looking at. Doesn't our view of life as Seventh-day Adventists inform us about life? Jesus is coming soon. This world is passing. This world is temporary. We believe that. So it does help, doesn't it, to put, put life in perspective. And if our house should burn down tomorrow, well... Well, well, there's a mansion that I am inheriting that will never burn down. And though all my clothing is gone, my whole wardrobe is destroyed, yet I know there's a, a beautiful white robe that I will wear that will never get old and will never fade and will never wear out. Paul said we do not look at things that are seen. If, if something is temporary, it exists only for a moment. And then in Paul's mind, it's as if it were a cloud that changes its appearance and then disappears. Our wealth, do we say, this is solid treasure? Well, if you cling to it, then its loss will be bitter. But you know what the Bible says about wealth? Well, it can fly away, fly away. It's something that is seen, therefore, it too is temporal and unsubstantial. As it is with wealth, so it is with poverty. You may say, well, I'm in poverty. But even that is not lasting poverty. Therefore, it is not a real poverty. We believe that in a short time, we will be walking with angels on streets of gold and be clad as richly as any prince or princess. So let us not fret or worry. My trials will soon be over, my sorrow will soon be over. My afflictions, which are but for a moment, will soon be over. This was Paul's view. This was Peter's view. This is the biblical view. Do you know who this man is? Do you know this man? His name is Jacques Lowe, L-O-W-E, Jacques Lowe. He was the official and personal photographer of John F. Kennedy. He was a very meticulous photographer who accumulated 40,000 negatives of images of the president and his family. 
only three to four hundred were ever made public. <clears throat> Mr. Lowe watchfully monitored the use of all of his pictures. If a publication ever wanted a print, or if a museum ever wanted a print, he personally took the negative to the lab for the printing, and when the job was done, he retrieved them back and put them back into safety. All 40,000 of his negatives were kept in a safe deposit vault in the safest place on earth that he could think of. A place that would never, ever be destroyed. I have a picture of the place, the safest place on earth, where Jacques Lowe stored all 40,000 images of JFK and his family. Here's a picture of it. The safest place on earth where he could store those images. The address was J.P. Morgan Chase Bank Branch at the address 5 World Trade Center. Mr. Lowe's daughter said he chose to have them there because he believed they were as safe as they could ever be. Ever. The safest place. After the September 11 attacks, the workers found fire damage in the vault area, and all those safe deposit boxes were filled with ash. Just ash. In the safest place he could think of on planet Earth. Today, may God give us hearts of wisdom. Nothing in this world is guaranteed. It is all passing away. Not only our treasures, but also our sorrows and griefs will soon be over. And the only place of safety, the only place of security for our future is where? In Jesus. That's the only safe place anywhere in the hands of Jesus. Is your life there? Is your life secure with him? Is your life in his safe hands for his keeping? Good. If you've been overwhelmed lately by what is seen, may our Lord comfort you with the surety of what is not seen. Eternity. His spirit. His presence. We hold on to it by faith. It's not by sight. It's by faith. And may we claim his treasures and his promises which give us hope for today.